introduce town heroes to the hometown. <laughs> so uh, I don't um, recall exactly when I first uh, met Joe Mitchell. I first started going to the computational geom symposium on computational geometry in 1988, and his was one of the faces I recognized. I, I remember thinking, oh, that guy. Then when I found out he got his PhD under Christos Papadimitriou in 1986 at Stanford, uh, I said, oh, that's where I have to know him from, since I was at Berkeley at the same time, and we had a Bay Area theory seminar, and then like, Berkeley and Stanford students would get together and buy each other. Uh, so, uh, but then much later, I found out that, uh, well, that I probably didn't meet Joe first at a Bay Area theory seminar. I could have met him much earlier. I, when we found out we actually were at the same elementary school at the same time. <laughs> So uh, I'm looking forward to hear his talk. I know this work because back in about 1995-96, David Epstein and I were writing a survey article on approximation algorithms for NP-hard geometric problems. And Joe Mitchell was one of the people who was advancing the state of the art so fast. We had to erase everything we wrote and write it over again every few weeks. Thank you. Okay, so yes, I'm talking about some old stuff, but I'm also going to talk about some new problems that I'm attacking with it. And one of my main open problems is how does this connect to the work that you do in formal mapping? I think there might be a connection, and I'm looking for other applications of this theorem. But let me start with a dedication. It's somebody's birthday. Anybody know who that is? From is somewhere in the room? Well, there might be. Anybody in the room <laughs> celebrating their birthday today? Okay, computational geometers. What is today? Birthday. Oh. <laughs> this morning I got up and wished Shamus happy 60th birthday. This is Michael Ian Shamus. He's often credited with starting the field. There was a thesis titled Computational Geometry. And I stumbled upon it quite by accident in the Stanford Library in 1982. And that's how I got into the field. OK, let me mention a problem that I've been interested in recently. Uh, actually, it was the motivation that got me into the, the, the work that Marshall referred to some 12 years ago. I was working with a PhD student here on the TSP with neighborhoods, which I didn't start. Esty started this with her work with Robin Hussein. The TSP, the traveling salesman problem, is probably well known. Given a set of points, find the shortest tour that visits them. What she looked at was, given a set of regions, let's say in the plane, that generalizes more to other cases, of course, find a shortest tour cycle, or maybe a path, that visits, that intersects every one of those regions. OK, this is an algorithmic problem. Um, I've been interested in the case of packings of disks. We give a set of disks in the plane. These are what you might call fat bodies in computation geometry. Find the shortest tour that visits all of these disks. And given the context of this workshop, I thought I had to get this figure and draw a uh, TSP with neighborhoods tour in red on this particular cir circle packing that comes from the book. Another thing that I'm probably going to start doing tomorrow uh, is. Uh, a problem that SD and Shandor and I worked on, which is the optimal lawn mowing problem, which is closely related to this. Uh, for every blade of grass, there's a neighborhood uh, defined by the radius of your lawnmower blade, and you need to cut every blade of grass, therefore you need to visit every disk. Okay, so this is another optimal touring problem that we worked on, and it contains some various hardness and approximation results. Another problem close and dear to my heart has to do with visibility and optimization. Given a polygon, simple polygon in this case, but it might be a polygon with holes, that's even more interesting. Find a shortest tour, that's shown in red, that sees everything. So the, this corner, in order to see it, you must visit this portion of the polygon, so you come over and sort of bounce off of it. And this is a problem that in simple polygons, we know how to solve exactly efficiently. But in polygons with holes, that's one of my open problems that motivates my current research. 
Now, I also work in sensor network applications, and in a paper with SD and others last summer, we looked at optimal power uh, assignments, uh, how, so if these black dots are, are sensors, and I want to read the data from them, and I want to travel along a tour, and every so often I'll stop, I will transmit, consuming some of my battery life, and, and suck the data out of these sensors. Um, how do I find the best tour where it might cost somehow is proportional to the length of the tour and the some function of the radii because that all has to do with the power consumption level necessary to gather data from these sensors. Uh, another sensor problem that's related to this work and approximation that I've been working on recently is given a set of sensors that broadcast certain radii uh, they form connected components, uh, but maybe several connected components, and you want them all to be interconnected. How do you minimize the number of new relay stations that you add? They might have slightly larger radii, something like that, that you're going to add to the plane in order to interconnect this. Uh, and there were some constant factor approximations that let you find these disks that interconnect. And here, the objective function is to minimize the number of disks that interconnect all of these sensor subnetworks. Uh, what we have in a recent work with uh, Alon Ekrat and Shandor Nektek is a PCAS to solve this problem based on the, uh, a variant of the main theorem that I'll show you today. Another problem I've been working on recently is the minimum weight convex subdivision. Given a set of points, let's say, in the plane, I want to decompose it uh, with a planar straight line graph whose faces are convex other than the face of infinity, of minimum length. What do I mean by minimum weight? Let's minimize the sum of the edge lengths, okay? And sometimes we'll allow you to add a Steiner point because that might save you length. That's the Steiner ver version of the minimum weight convex subdivision problem. Uh, and of course it's related to the famous minimum weight triangulation problem and minimum weight Steiner triangulation problem, and those are the two that I'm most actively working on at the moment, where we have some quasi-polynomial time approximation schemes known, and I'm working on a polynomial time approximation scheme possibly for this problem. I can do that problem. Okay, so what do I mean by approximation algorithms? Uh, we're, we're trying to determine efficient polynomial time algorithms, polynomial and some combinatorial input size of the problem, that gets you close to an optimal answer. That's because most of the problems, essentially all the problems that I've just uh, described, are NP-hard or worse, and we want to get close to the optimal answer. A C approximation gets you within factor C times opt. And if I'm dealing with minimization problems, as most of mine are today, uh, C will be some number bigger than one. You get within a factor C of optimal. Now, a PTAS, is a, is a family of algorithms that for any fixed epsilon positive gets you within one plus epsilon times optimal, okay? And if, and, and typically the dependence on epsilon will be bad, like n to the one over epsilon power or, or possibly worse than that. If it happens to be uh, polynomial in one over epsilon as well as n, the input size, then it's called a fully polynomial time approximation scheme and we have that for some other problems, but none of the ones that you see here. In fact, in general, they don't exist for these problems. Okay, so the traveling salesman problem is a basic problem. Given a set of points in the plane, uh, or in any fixed dimensional space, typically we work in Euclidean spaces, but it could be other spaces as well. It's known to be empty hard, as my advisor, Pop Dimitri, showed even in 2D, to find a shortest tour. Um, but as we teach in our elementary undergraduate uh, uh, courses, you can get close very easily because you can find what's called the minimum spanning tree efficiently by a greedy algorithm like Kruskal or Grimm, and then you can walk around it doubling it, and an easy argument shows that that gets you within factor two. And some 30 odd years ago, Christophetus showed that you can improve that with the clever use of an optimal matching algorithm on the odd degree nodes and get within 1.5, and that's where it was stuck for quite a while. Uh, until the results that uh, Marshall mentioned. Sanjeev Arora announced in early 96 
a polynomial time approximation scheme that ran in n to the order 1 by epsilon for solving two-dimensional geometric uh, DSP. And I discovered that I had a method that actually had been developed the year before and hadn't realized that it applied to give the same uh, result. And then I improved it to better dependence on epsilon. He improved his to even better dependence. And then Rowan <laughs> Smith improved the dependence to order n log n. Now, that, of course, that's hiding the dependence on epsilon. It's order n log n for any fixed dimension, any fixed epsilon. There's a 1 over epsilon to the d kind of power uh, or constant that's hidden there. It's a very complicated algorithm, uh, very clever, very sophisticated. I'm not covering that. I'm going to give you an elementary two-dimensional uh, argument that's really based on the old result of mine from 96. Um, and we also know that you're not going to get fully polynomial time approximation scheme for these problems. The TSP with neighborhoods, the one that's my current focus of attention, is, is one that I've been working on recently and just gave a talk based on some of this work at SOTA, uh, where I give a PTAS for fat disjoint regions. So for instance, circle patterns. What I mean by fat is, is a region where the uh, ratio of the circumscribing circle to the largest inscribed circle is bounded by a constant. Or I actually have a more general definition of that, or a weaker definition of that. But that's what I've been working on. Uh, now the background of the TSP of neighborhoods, as I mentioned, has to be brought to see, introduce the problem. Uh, it's obviously NP hard because it generalizes TSP on points. Uh, they gave some constant factor approximations for nicely shaped regions. They showed that obvious things that you might try to do for TSP with neighborhoods to reduce it to a TSP on points, for instance, doesn't seem to work. Um, with my PhD student, Christian Mata, we gave what's currently the best factor approximation. We deal with it log k times off, where k is the number of regions. Okay, For general regions, connected regions in the plane, that's still the best possible, although the running time has been improved. Um, but I'm working to improve that log factor to a constant at the moment. Uh, there's constant factor approximations that have been known for a variety of special classes of regions. I'm not going to go through this laundry list. p tasses were known uh, in a previous paper of mine for disjoint fat regions. Think of them as disks. That's the canonical case. So for unit disks, a packing of unit disks, I knew how to do it. I knew how to get a p-test, get arbitrarily close to optimal, based on some of these same tools and techniques. But it crucially relied on all the disks being essentially the same size, or bounded ratio between largest and smallest. And that's where we were stuck. So the new result that I just recently uh, presented is that even if they're arbitrary sizes, you can get a p-test. And that uses some new geometric now, there is some related work showing APX hardness. That's basically telling you that you're not going to get a PTAS for certain cases. In particular, uh, even for regions that are line segments, but possibly intersecting, you can't do better than a certain factor unless P equals MP. OK, so I, I won't go into these complexity things. But let me start with a, a, a small warm-up exercise for you. And, and I think there's some interesting questions here, too. Suppose that the, the regions that you want to visit are lines in the plane. So I give you n lines in the plane. Find a shortest tour that visits a set of lines. Now, it should be clear to you from local optimality that the, the picture looks like this. The optimal cycle will be a convex polygon. When it has a vertex, it's reflecting off of one of those lines. Angle in equals angle out. That's local optimality in calculus one. You might cross some lines and not reflect off of them, and you reflect off of others. The challenge is determine which ones you reflect off of. And it, I don't know a simple algorithm to do this efficiently or to determine which ones you reflect off of uh, and find this polygon. I can solve this problem with a sledgehammer pulling out a heavy gun for how we can approx uh, how we can compute optimal watchman routes in simple polygons. Because I can take the line arrangement, draw a big enough box around all the lines to contain all the vertices. Everywhere a line extends outside the box, make a little skinny spike. 
erase the lines, now I have a spike box. I have a, a box with spikes. And the only way that a, a mobile watchman can see the, uh, everything inside that polygon is to visit every line. Therefore, if I can solve the watchman root problem, which is a much more complicated problem, I can use it to solve this. I wish there were a simpler way to do it. Also, I don't, so, so this is saying, this is one type of TSP with neighborhoods that has a polynomial time solution. You give me infinite lines, I can solve it exactly in polynomial time. Are there any other cases? What if I give you a family of circles, hyperbolas, other curves, other special classes of shapes? I don't know. Um, and I'd love to know a different proof that this is an easy to solve problem. Um, and one of the fascinating Joe's, questions I've shared with some of you. Joe, is this the only one that I, that where the path is convex? Like, what's that? Is this the only one where the path is meant to be a convex? Um, no. no. Well, let's see. The obvious, it, you mean for arbitrary placements of whatever the regions they have are? Yeah, bounded regions. I mean. Yeah. So as soon as you have bounded regions, then I can force right. it to be. Uh, non convex, but um, it's probably true for algebraic curves. No, like parabolas, maybe, so long. Yeah. Right. Probably still with So that's the key point that they brought to Yeah, so I really haven't thought about that yet. That I was going to possibly raise this as one of the questions for the open proposition okay. last night. So you can work on this uh, during the coffee break. Um, <laughs> what, what about visiting planes in 3D? I think that's a more challenging one. So the analog of this, lift this question up to higher dimensions. Go to two flats in 3D. Um, SD and I have with uh, Marty and Eric Devane uh, PTAS for finding such tours. And it's also easy to see what they, how they behave locally. In 3D, if I have a plane, of course, I also have the reflection principle if I bounce off of it. And some of the planes I just pass right through. But how can I efficiently find what, you know, which planes I reflect off? How do I solve that problem? I have no idea. We don't know if it's hard, NP hard. We don't know if it's polynomial. We do have a PTAS. Okay. Um, so that's another interesting open problem. But what's the basic recipe for the PTAS that I'll talk about today? And it's the same recipe that Sanji Barora uses for his method and, and many other methods. Here's the way we argue. We're looking for an optimal structure of this particular type. For the TSP, you're trying to find a cycle, right? Uh, for a uh, minimum standard <coughs> tree, Steiner tree, or whatever, you're trying to find a tree, a, a smallest measure connected set. Whatever it is, there is an optimal solution. Now, I want to prove a structure here that converts that optimal solution to a network that has special structure, nice structure. Nice structure that helps me algorithmically solve it efficiently. I want it to have recursive structure um, that allows me to use recursive enumeration, essentially dynamic programming, to find an optimal network with that special structure. And my structure theorem will say that I can convert any solution that's optimal to my original problem into one that's in this special class of recursively solvable uh, structures without increasing its length by very much. So there's an approximation theorem. I can approximate any optimal solution with one of these nice structured solutions. Optimally find the best structured solution, and from it, if I design it correctly, I'll be able to extract an optimal solution to the original problem. That's the recipe. OK, what should that recursive structure be? Well, what I define as Guillotine strike. I didn't initiate the term guillotine. I, I started the term M guillotine. M doesn't stand for Mitchell. M, M stands for some integer parameter. M will be like here. I, I play this this structure. What I show in black. This is a network inside of a box. This this black network is three guillotine. What do I mean by that? I mean recursively I can use vertical or horizontal cuts to chop it up into pieces. And every time I chop it, when I cut, I cross my network a small number of times. O of n. Okay? Maybe m. It doesn't matter. It's m, 2m, whatever. 
but M is what's controlling the complexity of the cut. So here's a cut that crosses my network only two places. Maybe other places it crosses it millions of times. Chop it in two, recurse it, shrink the bounding boxes uh, to, to hit the vertices, and then recurse and keep chopping it into smaller and smaller pieces. And then here you end up with the, uh, yeah, and the leaves, these elementary pieces. Okay. Now, why do I want this kind of recursive structure? Because I want to solve the problem of finding the best, uh, the best network with this special structure uh, in polynomial time by recursive optimization using dynamic programming. So here's a window into my two-dimensional problem specified by a rectangle. There's only roughly n to the fourth different rectangles specified by n data points. There's a left, right, top, bottom. There's only n to the fourth choices. And there's some data inside this. And this scribble of white is somehow maybe the solution to my problem. What I care about in order to efficiently optimize my problem is that the data transfer that, could, that is the specification of the subproblem that says recursively optimize what's in this window, you have to be able to succinctly specify the problem. Tell me, okay, well, I'll give you the rectangle. You've got to do something or other to what's inside. And here's how you connect your solution to the outside world. The communication across the boundaries has to be succinct, small. And M will be the integer parameter that controls that level of communication. So if I had only a constant number, m, uh, edges crossing the boundary of each, uh, each side of this rectangle, then I could afford to tell you exactly each edge that's, that's going in, into the, the problem, and then you recurse inside and look for a cut somewhere. You optimize over all cuts. Here, perhaps, is a vertical cut. It could have been horizontal. And you, re and you optimize over all choices of a constant amount of communication across that cut. And then you've tabulated already the optimal solution to this smaller problem and this smaller problem. That's how dynamic programming works. And it will work provided that the communication across a boundary is constant. And it will depend on m. And m will be 1 over epsilon. OK, so the structure here says if I give you any set of edges of total length L, you can make it M guillotine. It might already be M guillotine, but if it's not, you can add some length to it to make it recursively of this structure, M guillotine. And the amount of length that you have to add is very small. It's only about 1 over M times the input size. OK? For any positive integer n. So here's a scribble. It has some length. I don't know if it's m guillotine. It depends what m is. If m is 15 million, I'm sure this is m guillotine. If m is 2, it's not. Okay. Um, while this scribble may not be m guillotine, you can make it m guillotine by adding only one mth of its length. And that's that's the theorem I'm going to sketch. So I, remember, I, it's a recursive definition of being m guillotine. You have to be able to cut with a nice vertical cut or a nice horizontal cut. And what does nice mean? It means it intersects only order M components. Well, maybe it's a big scribbled mess. And if you consider all possible vertical lines, every one of them crosses the scribble in many, many places, much more than M. Well, that means I'm going to have to add something. Well, well maybe I will we'll check the horizontal as well. But assume horizontal and vertical are both bad. Then, OK, maybe I have to construct a cut here, or, or I, I want to consider putting a cut here. Question? I'm sorry, but you, you must have a requirement about the complexity and the two sides of the cuts. I mean, right near the end, for example, you just, just cut that little tab twice. Right. So, you know, you so, some, so I didn't mean for this. Yeah. It's you, a separation. Right. So, so here, uh, you would, that there are good, nice, sparse cuts, like here and here. I just got lazy. So, so, so fill this in with oh, more scribble. Okay. okay. This sorry. is just meant to be. I'll see this place in a moment, but I don't see how by adding more you can reduce the number of intersections of a line like this. Okay. I, I, I'll show you. I'll show you exactly that because it's not the number of intersections; it's the number of connected components 
of the intersection of that line with the scribble. Okay, so watch this. So the, these first two dots are what you get when you come in from the top and come in from the bottom. That's sort of level one. Level two, level three, level four. Now suppose that I ask you, you are not allowed to have more than eight, or actually it's gonna be seven, connected components that this line makes with this scribble, the intersection. Right now there's lots more. There's this point, this point, this point, this point, etc. So what I will do to make it only seven is I will add this thick black line to my scribble. Now that's one connected component. There's many crossings, but I'm going to add that, the length of that, what I call a bridge. I will bridge the fourth point in from here with the fourth point in from there. And if this is position x, let's call that length of the bridge f of x. Okay? So I will add that. And now once I've built that bridge, this cut looks much more attractive to me. Because if I were to cut it here, then this problem and this problem communicate across a, a, a thickened border. Okay? That length is assumed to be there once I add it. So I have to build bridges. Somebody's got to pay. You've got to tax somebody to build a bridge, right? So I'm going to tax my original length of the scribble. Now, I'm not, I didn't draw the whole scribble. It's sort of too, it would be too messy. Here's part, part of the scribble. Here is the cut I'm considering. And I'm going to show you that this portion of it that I highlight in green is chargeable length. And what I mean by chargeable length for a given M is that if you look at this portion of this cut, there's at least M segments. If any ray that goes leftward crosses at least M segments of the scribble, M components of the scribble. And any ray to the right also does. In some sense, I call these M dark points. If you stand here and you're Superman, you can see through M minus one walls with your X-ray vision, but you cannot see through M walls then when you stand at a point along the green and look left-right, you cannot see out of the box. Okay? You are dark. Now, so some portion of this is M dark. Now, why is M dark important to me? It's important for my charging scheme because what I'm going to do is I'm going to say somewhere along this cut, I might be building a bridge. It may have nothing to do with the green portions, but I, I, I might build a cut of a certain length. Now, if the length of the green is more than the length of the bridge that I need to build, then I claim I have enough of a tax base to pay for it. Assume this is one unit. Split it in half. Half of it will get charged to the right, half will get charged to the left. Now, there are M levels, at least. There might be more. There's at least M levels here. This half charge that goes this way, I'll put one mth of it will be charged to the left side of this segment. One mth of half of it will be charged to the right side of that segment, etc. Here's the second level. The third level. I've taken this length, I'm, collect, I'm taxing this, and I'm distributing the weight half to the right, half to the left, and splitting it up one mth per level. Okay? And the overall argument says that any segment of the original scribble will never get charged from its left by more than one mth of one half of its length, and from its right by one half of one mth. In total, one mth. So one mth of the total length is all I will pay in total on in this taxation, in this charging scheme. Why? Because if I were to make the cut here, and charge my taxpayers according to this scheme. I will never charge the left side of this segment ever again, because, or this segment, or this segment, because these now are too close to the boundary. This is a new subproblem, a new rectangle, and you'll never charge this again because you'll never find a point that's M dark in this new rectangle. There could be M this way, but that way there's not M. So every time you make this cut, you're exposing these portions of the length 
to the boundary of the new subproblems, and you'll never expose them again. Okay? So that's how the charging works. What's missing here is a key lemma. I'm going to claim that somewhere, if you look at an arbitrary scribble like this, somewhere I will be able to find a cut where the, uh, the cost of construction can be paid for. Okay, so here, let me advance back through here. Here's the charging scheme. Actually, let me do it by picture and then I'll come back to this. Here's a scribble. For simplicity, I drew it as a rectilinear scribble. But that's irrelevant. This could be curved, anything. Anything. I'm just looking for one measure of this, of this scribble. Consider a vertical cut at position x. I let f of x be the cost of construction. So here I come in 2. 1, 2, and I come down 2. And the length of this gap here, I'll call f of x. Now, if it were ever 0, which is not in this case, as I sweep across here, it's never of 0 height. In fact, the, 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 the segment, the bridge, if I paint it red, I get this region, the red region. Okay, and f of x is the vertical slice of that region. And if I integrate f of x dx, I get the area of the red. But there's another way you can get the area of red that we teach in our freshman calculus, and that is you can integrate h of y dy, where h of y is the chargeable length. Well, let, let's understand. Consider a horizontal cut at position y. I claim this is chargeable because it's inside the red. That means every point here has at least m levels above it and at least m levels below it. Because this red stuff is what's dark with respect to vertical. Okay? So the chargeable length of this horizontal cut would be the length of the blue, what I'll call h of y. The area of red is integral f of x dx. It's the same as integral h of y dy. Now, here I'm considering vertical cuts. Also, I'm considering horizontal here in just a second. Same picture now. What would the cost be if I cut horizontally here? I would come in 2, 1, 2, come in 2, or m, 1, 2. This length here, call it g of y, is the cost of that horizontal uh, cut if I were to add, add that as a bridge. Integral g of y dy is the area of blue. Now, one of the two areas, red or blue, has to be greater than or equal to the other. Without loss of generality, assume red is greater than blue. But the area of red could be written as integral of chargeable length, h of y dy. If that's greater or equal to the blue, then integral h of y dy is greater or equal to integral g of y dy. Therefore, there exists a y star where h is greater than g. Therefore, there exists a cut where the tax base is enough to pay for the construction of the bridge. You can charge it off. And that's the key lemma. With that, the structure goes through. And if you're used to looking at these things, you should already be convinced that there's a PTAS for Euclidean TSP. What I found remarkable about this was the simplicity of it. it no. That's the proof. Now, how do you apply it to various problems? Here is a subproblem, let's say, where here's some points. I want to build, say, a minimum spanning tree, minimum length spanning tree, Steiner tree, of a set of points. I'm looking at this subproblem. Now, the boundary information, remember, I sometimes add a segment. Okay? So, so on the boundary, you could have isolated points, you can have segments in general. But you'll have, but for my algorithm, all I have to do is specify a constant amount, O of M amount of data, for each of the four sides of the rectangle. And the responsibility of this subproblem is to interconnect all these data points, connecting them, communicating with the outside world only through the boundary information, which is constant specifiable. So there's only N to a constant amount of data that pass to the subproblem, plus you, there's only a constant amount of these sort of connections. These blue things are saying, well, inside this subproblem, you are responsible for somehow connecting this piece to those pieces, or this dot to those dots, etc. 
And now what you'll do is you'll recur, but there's only a constant number of those because even though it's exponential in the constant, exponential function of the constant is still constant. So now you look at all possible cuts, horizontal or vertical, iterate over all possibilities, just write it recursively, and tabulate the answers. And that's the solution to the dynamic program that finds the cheapest M guillotine structure that spans a set of points. That's the easiest of the DPs to, to realize. And this is just a specification of it, what your objective is. You specify a rectangle, you specify boundary information, you specify this boundary connectivity information and optimize. Now, the problem I've been working on, in fact, I was working on 12 years ago when, when this stuff just accidentally happened, was the TSP with neighborhoods. And, the, and I thought, oh, this should solve it. But there's a problem. While I can bridge all the, the structure of my network, when I have regions, the problem is that they cross the boundary. And I could have lots and lots of regions that straddle the boundary. And even if you allow me to build these bridges where the network itself is succinctly specifiable across a boundary, there's another issue. What is this subproblem responsible to visit? In the case of points, it's responsible to visit all the points that are in the box and not visit the points that are outside the box. But when you have regions, they can straddle the boundary. For each of these regions, I can't afford to, to specify as part of my input to the subroutine, yes or no, you're responsible to visit this. So this, this one was visited on the inside. This one's visited on the outside. This one on the inside. That's one bit per region. There could be n of them. That's two to the n. That's too much data to be polynomial time. Okay, that's the fundamental problem. Now the new structure, I figured out a way to build bridges also among the regions. Not just on the network that you're optimizing, but the regions themselves. I didn't think this was possible because in fact you can argue that you can't afford to, to do the same kind of bridging that you do with the network. It turns out the best you can hope for is to bridge uh, sort of all but a logarithmic number of the regions. But that's just right, because there's only one bit I need. I don't need to specify a lot of information for each region. I just have to tell you yes or no. And two to the log n is polynomial. So it's, it, it works perfectly. And the log comes from a geometric insight. So, and so this is the new subproblem, and there are these regions that straddle it. I build region bridges that, that you'll have only a logarithmic number of regions and then bridge everything else, okay? And you'll build the usual bridges where you have only a M crossings and then bridge everything else. And that makes it nice and succinct. And capital M will turn out I need to, to, to use log. And that's exactly what the mathematics allows you to so again, there's an optimization, this is the counting, and you'll end up with n to the order m running time where, where that will be n to the one by epsilon. So the structure, uh, I now call it mm guillotine, uh, and it's defined recursively. Similarly, I compute with dynamic programming, I use the same framework, but now plugging in the mm guillotine structure here. Uh, there's a lot of details. But the new structure theorem says that you, if, it, if the optimal solution isn't already mm guillotine, well, by the previous argument, you can make it m guillotine by adding one, roughly 1 over m times m. To bridge the regions, it turns out that you're going to be doing the, the sum of the diameters of the regions will, will show up here. And how big can that be? That, that, that's going to determine my m. And it turns out that that, uh, I'll, be, I'll be able to, to prove this key lemma, which says that the total length of the optimal solution is at least 1 over log n times that number. Therefore, I can afford to pick capital M to be roughly log n. And that log shows up as follows. This is the key observation. If I'm trying to visit fat regions, they could be disks in a circle packing or something, or here they're, they're 
L infinity disks, they're, they're squares. If I, if I traverse a unit distance and I look at a packing of squares, the sum of the sizes of the squares that I can touch along a unit traversal can be as bad as log n. This structure sort of shows it to you. So this square gets touched in its, say, of size one half. And then I've got two squares of size a quarter, four squares of size an eighth, etc. And if n is the number of regions, it's, it's show, this is actually showing that my upper bound will be tight, and this is the lower bound. And there's an argument I have to go through to prove this. I don't have time right now. It uses a packing argument, an area argument. And that's where I'm using disjointness and fatness of the regions. So I'll skip this. I bucket them into a logarithmic number of length classes. And the main new theorem is that the TSP with neighborhoods for arbitrary fat regions has a p-text using this structure here. So in particular, for circle packings in the plane, you can find the best structure that visits them. And possibly other structures involving circle packings you can approximate within 1 plus epsilon times r. That's, that's what I think is relevant. And there's various generalizations and extensions. Here's a, here's a chart of what I know about 2D TSP with neighborhoods. I break it into eight possibilities. This column is the regions are fat, the regions might be skinny, like line segments. The regions have arbitrary size, the regions have comparable size. And what I show in here are, for two more cases, either they're disjoint regions or non-disjoint, what the approximation factors are that we know. The most general is non-disjoint, arbitrary crossing, skinny, arbitrary size. The best result is, is what I had before, a log factor. Uh, and I won't be able to get a p-tens, but I could get a small constant, perhaps. This new result shows that this, which used to be a constant factor, becomes a PTAS. I conjecture PTAS is for this column, constant for this column. And within the last several weeks, I've been able to improve both of these as well. Using this and another structure result, I can improve this. First, I improved it to a constant, now to a PTAS. Non disjoint, arbitrary size, fat regions. Disks that arbitrarily overlap now, they don't have to be a packing, arbitrary sizes, you can find tours and other structures approximately optimally, as close as you wish, using this structure. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. A p task means you come with an epsilon of optimal. For any well, fixed epsilon. comes to you with a bounded factor, and log n means you get the log n of the optimal. That's right. In fact, all in polynomial time. That's right. All in polynomial time. And I conjecture that this you can do in constant. That's what I'm working on right now. Now, I have, this is the last slide. I have a laundry list of problems that I've been working on over the years, and it's actually much longer than this. Uh, but these are a few of the highlights. Um, so what do we know? p tasses and here I'm mostly focusing on 2D. Uh, Rao and Smith's generalization of Sanjeev Aurora's p task for TSP, for instance, applies to any fixed dimension. I think these techniques lift to higher dimensions as well. But I've been focusing mostly on 2D. Uh, TSP, Steiner minimum spanning tree, those were all the original results. Also, red blue separation. If I give you red points and blue points in the plane, then I want the shortest cycle that separates red from blue. That's another NP hard problem that this technique solves with a P test. I told you that recently I've been able to, I mean, it, it's pretty immediate that, that you can do the minimum weight convex subdivision if you allow Steiner points. It's harder if you don't allow Steiner points. Uh, TSP with neighborhoods, if the regions are fat, I can now do. The orienteering problem, Sariel Harpelet and his student showed how my structure theorem can, can solve that. The orienteering problem uh, is this classic one where you have, or the bank robber problem, if you're a bank robber, you have a certain amount of gasoline in your car, you want to rob the most banks until you run out of gas, okay? <laughs> and um, so there you're trying to maximize the number of banks you hit or the total haul that you take from the banks. And in turn, I mean, it's sort of the flip side of the, it's the sort of dual to the TSP. Uh, but Sariel was able to extend my structure theorem to get a p-test for that. And the lawn mowing problem, I can do a p-test for that as well. 
What I don't know, these are more interesting, TSP with neighborhoods for disjoint regions in 2D. I know I won't be able to get a p-test if the regions are allowed to intersect arbitrarily. But if they're disjoint, maybe there is a p-test. If they intersect arbitrarily, I think it's constant back. The vehicle routing problem, where you have either multiple vehicles, well, there's many versions of it. But let's say minimum weight cover with K-tours. What's a K-tour? K-tour is a, a tour for a delivery vehicle that visits at most K customers. So, you know, uh, you know, UPS sends out multiple trucks to try to deliver these things. Each truck can only hold K packages. Find a set of tours that cover all the customers that has minimum cost. That's the simplest version that we don't know how to approximate with these techniques. Uh, my techniques, which are closely related to Sanji, Aurora's techniques, we don't know how to do the vehicle routing problem yet. The other version of this is if you have degree three and degree four spanning trees, it turns out, well, we don't even know if it's be hard to, to find the shortest degree three spanning tree, but we do know for degree four, uh, bounded degree spanning trees is, is one of the problems I'm working on right now. I think I can do degree three spanning trees with the PTAS. Uh, not sure. Minimum weight triangulation, uh, that was just recently shown at Sausage last year to be NP hard. Um, and last year there was also a quasi polynomial time approximation scheme based on a variant of Aurora's techniques. I'm working towards a, um, hopefully, a P test for that. Watchman root problem if you have a polygon without holes, it's polynomial time solvable. If you have a polygon with holes, it's closely related to TSP with neighborhoods, but I don't know of any constant factor approximation for it, let alone a PTAS other than some special cases I don't have time to get into. Um, and another problem that I'm working on with some of the students that are here is minimum area triangulated surface. So this would be like the plateau problem in higher dimensions. So let's say I give you a set of points in 3D and I want to find a cartographic map, a surface, a terrain surface of minimum area that goes through those points, say a triangulated surface of minimum total area. We don't know how to approximate even with a, with a constant factor approximation, let alone with a p-test. But perhaps some of these techniques will apply. And I guess, like I said, I'll end with the open problem of are there structures, are there, are there things that you would like to compute that perhaps have to do with disk packings and such that this kind of a structure here could help solve approximately to any desired degree of approximation. I'll leave that as the final open problem. Questions? All right, thank you. That min area triangulated surface is, is that with or without Steiner points, and is it known to be NP hard? Um, both good questions. Uh, so I'm interested in both with and without Steiner points. Um, with Steiner points, we thought we had a hardness proof, but it fell apart. Uh, well, but that's for a, a, a slightly different problem. So. So Ellie, yours doesn't do the area yet, it just does the... Okay, so one of the things we think is relevant to finding the minimum area triangulation is if I give you points in 3D, find a spanning tree of the points whose projection into 2D has no self-intersections. So find a minimum length spanning tree. Because once you, once you connect the dots, you can fill in the, the triangulation with dynamic programming to find the minimum area. Uh, uh, surface, triangulated surface. So you could view it as a two-stage thing. First connect the dots, much like we do for, for minimum weight triangulation, right? Connect the dots and then fill in the faces. And we showed that the, it's not clear it's, it's related, but it, if you try to minimize the length of the non-crossing spanning tree, Ellie Packard has a proof of hardness. We don't yet have a, uh, a, an approximation algorithm. We shot down several natural attempts. Um, you know, this edge insertion is good for min-max criteria, so minimize right. the maximum triangle or something like that. Right, that's so right. Minimize somehow we're, now we're, we're doing this global measure. Well, the sum uh, ones tend to be harder, but yeah. the min-max area maybe, we might have even looked at that, but, you know, that one, 
you know, I would suspect would be in P. Right. So we haven't looked at that one yet. I, I'm actually motivated by this you know, uh, uh, problem because it's, it's, it's the min cut problem for routing thick paths in 3D. I, I'm looking for routing sort of tubes in 3D, sort of the, the plateau problem uh, to get an approximation. Of it. I don't know how to do that. There are some, TC Hu has done a discretization to solve this, where he takes a voxel world and he, and he sets up a network flow model and says max flow equals min cut. So this is in the presence of sort of obstacles. But I don't see how to do that with interpolating points on the surface. And to, to use these approximated, you know, to, because you get a min cut from the max flow theory. And can you use that to get an approximate minimum surface uh, in, in this set? Yeah. My other question is not really for you though, because I asked you this before and I didn't understand your answer. <laughs> or maybe for some of the other people who throw something in there. It had to do with the existence of a minimum weight Steiner triangulation, which you asked. And then I thought about this and the next day came back with five points in the plane and a proof that there was no Steiner minimizing triangulation. And you said, well that's no good because the Steiner point you had is on the convex hull boundary. Yeah. So then I came back the next day with seven points with no minimum triangulation, and none of the Steiner points were on the boundary, they were in the inside, but it was no good because three of the points were collinear. Right. And um, <laughs> right. so that disallowed it. So if we could just come up with like the actual formulation of what right. is or is so, not so allowable. Among the, three of, among the three of us here, Marshall, Jack, and I, we should be able to answer your question. But you and, and the Steiner points, so you have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, for or the we, others, I mean, there's a question. If you're trying for, to find the minimum weight triangulation, or yeah. minimum weight triangulation, there's only a finite number to try, a huge number, but there's a minimum. Without allowing stuff. But if you allow extra points, you could add. Um, Potentially, it yeah. could be beneficial to just keep adding. Infinitely many or undoubtedly right. many. It may be that the minimum weight Steiner triangulation is only achieved in, in the limit. And so there's some simple configurations which we discussed in which, as the Steiner points start to collide, with an existing point, the length goes down and down and down, and the minimum doesn't occur because the two edges come together or points come together. But then he had some reason for saying that's not really a non-existence of the thing because they exist in a de degenerate way because they thought of it as two edges overlapping. Yeah. But I, I, <laughs> what's the actual formal? Uh, every time I thought of it, I came up with a counterexample, it was going to be disallowed for some reason. <laughs> anything you could think of overnight couldn't possibly be interesting enough <laughs> to the answer to the problem. I think David Epstein is the ultimate referee in right. this one, because to my knowledge, I think he made up... Well, I read his paper, uh, and I thought I was going based on what he said, but well, when I brought to Joe, to... he said, well, he really meant to say non-collinear, he meant to yeah, say non Yeah, he, out he also well. wasn't precise enough in yeah. his paper of what is meant by a minimum weight Steiner triangulation, what, what conditions he was allowing. It's um, whatever is just out of reach of Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's a carrot thing right? <laughs> every time. So yeah, we could just have a mathematical the, something we can you can't back out of right. the next meeting. <laughs> not really what we meant. We're we're just surprised you find the problem interesting. So uh, well, it's a, it seems like it's a compactness argument, right? You first have some argument that says the number of Steiner points is bounded because if there was more than a zillion of them, some small disk would have a zillion over a hundred of them. And that couldn't possibly be efficient because just to visit them is is too much. Right. And once you have a bound on the number, then there's some kind of compactness because now it's a finite dimensional problem. So there ought to be a minimum, assuming that certain things don't collapse when you pass the limit. And that's what the collinearity problem. Right. Well, as soon as you have three collinear points, you can sort of build things that collapse. And the reason there's no minimum is because there would be a minimum except that things disappear suddenly when two edges two edges come together, all of a sudden they're one edge. Yeah. One of the edges has vanished in the limit. And that's what's preventing the infimum from being a minimum. But um, that, that makes it easy to find, so it's not existing. So you'd just be happy as long as the, all the points are not, no three of them are linear, or there's some other conditions you should know about. So what's, I just wanted to come up with the, like, the, the rock solid, you know, yeah, I, I, I think we should be able to do this, and, and I meant to write to David Epstein as well. Yeah. After I don't know if you can reach him, because I didn't invite him to this conference, but I never got any return email from him. I don't know if his spam book was so effective. Anything from mathematicians. <laughs> 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 I, 
I heard <coughs> from indirectly just a few days ago, the Brazilian guys who implemented our cutout thing, apparently they got it. They, they thanked David for, rid of, for whatever he sent them. Oh. I sent them something. We had every, you know, we were all CCing each other, but David was right into the Brazilians. So. Well, I would like to mention him because I'm very proud of my, uh, my formal mapping paper. It references papers of two different David Epsteins. Not, uh, I've heard people, spelled the same. I've heard yeah, people one say that's like both. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank the speaker again.